Arms & Armor is known as one of today's best makers of reproduction, well-researched European historic weapons. So let's check out this awesome sword by Arms & Armor, the Schloss Erbach Medieval Sword. Stick with me guys, let's check this out. What is up guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Mike and I have a real treat for you guys here today. So this is a sword that I've been waiting to review and show you guys for a really long time. And it's been such a long time because it took that long for it to be made and shipped out to me uh, here where I live. So uh, finally got it probably about, I don't know, maybe three weeks ago. And um, I ordered it, I wanna say maybe nine months ago. So. As, it, as you can see, these things, they take quite a while to produce because um, they are all handmade and they're using premium materials and they have a large back order. And I'm talking about this sword here, which is the Arms and Armor Schloss Erbach uh, German Longsword. Now, this sword is actually produced, uh, I'm sorry, is replicating an existing piece uh, that survives today um, at the Hewitt Oakshot Institute. Um, they have the original there and Arms and Armor had 100% complete access to the original sword when making uh, their particular uh, replica, which is here. So this is a thoroughly and meticulously well-researched and well-reproduced um, functional European sword. Now it's using modern materials and we'll talk about the actual materials that they use to create this sword in a little bit. But I just wanted to let you know that this is probably one of the highest quality uh, replicas of this particular sword that you can get on the market. Now, that does not come cheap. This is a high-end reproduction sword. Uh, you're not going to be able to touch this for probably less than $1,000. Um, they go for... You might be able to find one on the secondary market, but brand new, they go for $995. And then there are some other options that you can add on there. Like I added this custom grip color here. This is um, all leather. And this is what they call um, like a light brown leather wrap. That was an extra option. It wasn't really that expensive. It was probably, I think it was like 35 extra dollars. So that puts this sword well over, um, you know, a thousand dollars and into the high-end range when it comes to reproduction functional European swords. So uh, great quality craftsmanship and great research does not come cheap and that um, probably goes with many different things out there um, when it comes to production products and that's no different when, when it comes to swords. Anyway, so we are going to get into the review of this thing and I must say I am thoroughly impressed. Uh, I have not cut with this as the as the filming of this portion of the video. There will be a cut test obviously in this video. And uh, but this is as it is right now my first impressions. This thing is really quite impressive in many different regards and we're going to get into that piece by piece. I'm going to start looking here at the hilt. I'm going to show you as best as I can in detail all of the fine features and things about this sword that make it so special and uh, we'll go there we'll go just you know we'll go piece by piece I'll show you and um, you guys can check this fine awesome sword out uh, with me uh, but before I do that I just want to show you guys that uh, if you do have this book a lot of collectors have this book. This is Records of the Medieval Sword by Ewart Oakshot. This is a great book to have, guys, just for reference as well as um, just general information and knowledge. Anyway, this Schloss Erbach sword is actually listed in there, and here it is. Here's a picture of the original and some stats and some information here. Um, so this is the actual sword that this sword is um, attempting to replicate. And this is the sword that Arms and Armor had in their hands at the time of um, their research when they were putting together their measurements and trying to figure out how they were going to reproduce this thing. Now, as far as I understand, this is almost, 
almost like a one-to-one -one reproduction of the original sword. Now, obviously, the original sword um, did have a black leather grip, as far as I'm concerned. It might have been brown originally and just turned black over the years. But the sword, the original sword, was extremely well-preserved and well-kept um, in an armory in Germany. And um, it was, I think, found by you at Oakshot sometime maybe in the 60s or 70s um, at the Schloss Erbach Castle in Germany and uh, that's where it resided for many many years and it was extremely well preserved so they were able to see all of the detail of the original and reproduce it here in a uh, meticulous fashion so uh, we're gonna change the camera angle and I'm gonna show you guys um, going from hilt all the way up to the top of the blade the fine details of this awesome sword so let's check it out Okay guys, we are at a different angle now so I can show you piece by piece and section by section uh, as close as I can so you guys can kind of see the detail um, of the features of this sword and uh, I can give you my opinions and tell you what I think and um, also, um, you know, you guys can form your own opinions by the footage that you see here. Now, the thing is, is you really have to handle one of these things to appreciate it 100%, but I will do the best I can here to show you um, what I can. So let's first start with this, uh, the pommel. Now this is what I assume is a mild carbon steel. Now I do think it is a carbon steel because um, it does pick up rust and uh, some staining from your fingerprints pretty quickly. So uh, whatever they're using at Arms and Armor for their fittings um, seems to be definitely a carbon steel and a type of uh, mild carbon steel. But anyway, you can see that the sword has this twisted, uh, twisted uh, ball pattern uh, on the, the pommel. Now, I don't think that this is a, an official classified type of pommel in the Hewitt Oakshot typology. Um, I think it's just considered unclassified, but it is fairly common among German swords of the late 15th century. Um, I can't say it's really common, but you do see it um, there more than anywhere else. And basically what you have here is a twisted pattern that I think is very, very beautiful. Uh, you can take a look at the bottom here. Um, there is the peen, which is done rather nicely. And um, you can see some tooling marks around what is essentially kind of like a peen block. Um, and there's more of the twisting pattern there. And um, also, as you can see, there's these grooves. So you have uh, primary twists. And then in those twists, you have this grooving here, which I assume is done all by hand because they are not symmetrical or, or even. And uh, you can see some uh, casting um, anomalies here, as well as, you know, quite a bit of tooling markings and uh, casting, you know, anomalies and whatnot. So that is part of the handmade nature of this type of sword. Now, I think it mimics uh, the medieval aesthetic quite nicely, but if you are looking for straight machine perfection, um, I don't think that this is going to be for you. But if you like this handsome medieval style, uh, handmade aesthetic, which I personally do, um, this is much closer to the actual original and uh, swords like it of the time period uh, then then you're gonna love this and I love it it has a very nice handmade quality um, to it and the twisted the twisting pattern or well, the twisted pommel pattern um, is beautiful aesthetically we'll talk about what it feels like in terms of handling characteristics later on as to whether or not it's comfortable. So that, that will be a separate part of the review. But as it is aesthetically, it is beautiful and it is very high quality um, in its work workmanship and, and detail. Um, like I said, it's they're trying to mimic the original here as best as possible. And so this is what the original was like. You can see a lot of imperfection and asymmetry and um, that is 
basically falls throughout um, this sword. Now, um, if symmetry and perfection and machining is something that you're after, um, that's not really what Arms and Armor does. Um, a lot like Lance Connect Emporium, they are trying to reproduce historical pieces as close to the originals as they can. Uh, whereas someone like um, Albion, for whatever, uh, they, they they produce historical designs, but they're more in line with trying to get a machined perfection or perfected look. And you're not going to get that here. But anyway, the pommel is absolutely beautiful. It is one of the eye-catching features of this sword. Um, as well, you know, the whole sword, in my opinion, is a beautiful sword. And... Um, the pommel definitely adds to that. When we move up to the grip, uh, what you can actually see here is um, it has a center riser here. Actually, it's a double riser. Um, and it has this wasted shape where it thins out here, which is also very common um, in swords throughout the medieval period, especially the, the 15th century. Um, it is definitely ergonomically shaped it do, it's not as round as it actually looks um, it does have a um, it is sort of flatter this way than it is this way here so it is extremely comfortable and and very very nice to hold um, and the wasting and stuff allows for just some natural placement of the hands and um, yeah, it's extremely comfortable. Now, one thing that is very, very impressive is the quality of this leather that they used here. This is probably the best leather wrap grip I have ever seen. Um, the quality is just, you really have to hold it to appreciate it. And it is absolutely beautiful. And uh, there is a seam here, which um, in this footage looks fairly prominent. Um, but I have to tell you, you cannot feel this at all when you're actually holding the sword. Um, I like where they put it here as opposed to somewhere over here or something like that. But it really is seamed up very, very nicely and it's extremely comfortable and it's a lot less... It's a lot more low profile than it actually looks in this footage here. And it's extremely well done. And it definitely has that handmade aesthetics, uh, aesthetical feature that um that they're going for here and, it, and and i can imagine and like i said i have not handled the original but they did that this is exactly what it was like so um they did a fantastic job on this grip i love it now this color is um like a i forget what they actually call it in, in their catalog but it is like a like a i don't know like a rustic light brown i think they might call it modeled uh, light brown or whatever, but I love how it has that sort of worn and um, almost dirty look to it. I love it. it. It it really just adds to the authenticity of this design and it's um, a genuine historical research that went into it. Now, like the original grip, I think, like I said, is uh, black. Um, but I'm not really sure if that's what it was originally. It could have been light, light brown and just turned black over years. Remember, it's hundreds and hundreds of years old. So um, it probably turned black over time. But there are a bunch of different um, color options. There's a, there's a really cool green that I almost went for um, because I really like green leather. And um, But I do have to say, and we'll talk about handling characteristics later, uh, the grip is very, very comfortable, and uh, it is a little bit short for a sword that has a blade that is this long, and we'll talk about that later once again, but this is the actual original length of the, uh, the grip, the grip length of the original was uh, exactly like this. So, um, you know, uh, if it's short for some people or too short for, um, you know, some types of swordsmanship that people like to do, uh, well, you can blame the original creators of the sword and not arms and armor. <laughs> anyway, it's a fantastic grip uh, and pommel. I absolutely love it, and uh, it is definitely one of the features 
or aesthetical features of the sword that I just really admire. In fact, I admire the whole sword, but anyway, let's move on to the cross guard. It's a little bit difficult here to get uh, fully in camera. You can see here, it, it is a considerable um, size cross guard. All right, a lot of, um, you know, considerable length. I didn't actually measure it for the review. I probably should have, but I just kind of wanted to get this out there. Um, and it has this beautiful twisted pattern on the Quillians, and you can see that they have um, what it looks like from that angle. And um, that it actually flares out. Um, it is not entirely straight. It actually flares here towards the end and it is quite handsome and beautiful and actually quite unique. Uh, there are not a lot of swords that I have seen, uh, both in reproductions and historical originals that have this type of uh, cross guard pattern and design. And like once again, uh, if we're talking you at Oakshot's typology, this is sort of an unclassified type. Um, it's a lot like, uh, well, I'm not really going to get into it, but um, it, it's it's very unique to this sword. And it's it's just, um, you know, you can find twisted pattern quillions in a lot of swords. I'm just trying to say uh, it's not very, very common. I, 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 at least, it's not common on the reproduction market. I'm not, can't really speak to how common it would have been in period. But it seems to me it's like it's definitely a... German feature um, of long sword design. Um, but one of the things that's actually um, interesting is, oops, sorry, this is actually kind of hard to get, um, is that you have this sort of rectangular midsection here, and then it sort of turns into bars, and then, you know, completes the pattern here. So that's actually um, quite interesting, once again, not a very common design feature, but I actually, some people don't like this type of design for Quillions. I actually love it. I think it's very elegant and beautiful. Uh, moving up to the gap in the cross guard, this is always a um, point of contention among sword collectors and enthusiasts. You can see that the gap is pretty considerable um, and you know, there's a lot of asymmetry there. Um, so you can see it's a, a pretty considerable gap. Now, that may bother some people uh, for a sword in this particular price range. Like I said, if you take a look at swords like Albion, they have probably like the most tiny, tiniest gaps in the cross guard. They got a very precision machined cross guard. Uh, this here, as you can see, is not. You can tell that this was all done by um, hand tooling and whatnot. But uh, this is exactly how the original looks. <laughs> and how do I know that? Because uh, if you go to um, the U at Oakshot Institute's website, they have a 3D modeling feature of this sword. And you can actually rotate the sword um, to the angle where you can see the cross guard and the gap, and that is exactly what it looks like. So I do believe that Arms and Armor did have the ability to uh, create a smaller gap in the cross guard and actually get that very, very closely fit. However, that is not how the original is. Uh, the original has a sizable gap in the cross guard just like this. So, um, you know, they were going for historical accuracy here and they actually reproduced that uh, in the gap in the cross guard here. So, uh, like I said, some, that, that might be something that bothers people. That doesn't really bother me as long as the construction is really, really tight and there's no looseness and there's absolutely no wiggle or uh, play in this particular cross guard. Uh, at least not yet. I haven't cut with it and I don't anticipate it happening. Um, but yes. So, like I said, if that is something that bothers... Oh, Sword is this. That's something that really, um, you know, that is basically a preference, right? If you're going to spend money on a sword, that's like over a thousand dollars for a sword. Uh, here, 
I was aware that this is going to happen and that this was about historical accuracy and not about precision, uh, precision machining. And I'm cool with it and I actually appreciate that they took the time to include that in their in their reproduction okay so uh, moving on to the blade um, so what you have here is a typical diamond shape uh, cross section uh, it is not hollow ground uh, it is basically a standard diamond shape cross section that runs uh, straight up the blade right to the tip now the interesting thing about this type 18a which is what it was classified as uh, is that it has um, a very broad blade it is uncharacteristically broad for this time period or I should say this type of sword uh, it's one of the things that I really like about it because it shows that um, whoever ordered this sword originally or had it made wanted cutting power um, over thrusting power now you can thrust with this but it does not have a particularly acute tip you know you can see there it's kind of almost like a spatulate style tip but um, it, it is it definitely can thrust and it does come to a point but you can see that this sword definitely uh, in terms of design feature and uh, width favors the cut. And it's one of the things I really like about it. I love a sword um, that has a diamond shape cross, uh, cross section and profile um, that is fairly broad and designed for cutting. Uh, you guys, if you check out my channel, I have a review of the Dark Sword Armory Alexandria, which is sort of like the the most extreme um, version of a Type 18 in terms of width. Uh, it's called the Type 18C, and it is incredibly broad, and I loved it. I sold that sword. Um, but this one here <clears throat> has a broad blade that stays fairly consistent. Um, you know, it does taper, and, you know, I'll see if I can actually put some measurements down in the description below. It does have profile taper and it does have significant uh, distal taper that matches the uh, measurements and proportions of the original sword. So, yeah, very fantastic blade shape um, and design. And it, it, it it's not a light sword. And like I said, once again, what we, we will talk about... Um, handling characteristics in a separate portion of the review um, after I do my cutting with it, which I have not done yet. But um, it's not a light sword. It's definitely a hefty sword. I wouldn't call it heavy, but it's definitely not light. You could wield it with one hand, but the blade being as broad as it is and staying as broad as it is um, all the way up to the tip definitely gives it a very... Uh, weighty feel and um, fit for very powerful cuts. Um, so, yeah, the blade material is 6150 high carbon steel, probably one of the most premium steels that you can use for a functional modern day replica sword. It's what Albion uses, it's what a lot of high end makers use. Uh, it's very expensive because it's a very good quality. Uh, durable steel with excellent um, ability to be heat treated and uh, excellent edge retention. So yes, it's a 6150 high carbon. And uh, I will say that in terms of uh, people like to know, you know, is it wavy? Does it have waviness? It's kind of hard to get on camera here. Um, it is relatively flat. I mean, you can see some rippling because this is a hand forged blade. This is not uh, done by stock removal, I believe. This is 100% hand forged. And so it does have some asymmetry. The center ridge does wander a little bit. Um, it's not the worst that I've seen. Uh, it's not the best that I've seen either, but uh, it is definitely uh, done very, very nicely. And uh, it just, it is uh, quite a beautiful blade profile and blade shape. So um, yeah, that pretty much does it for this particular camera angle. 
Let's get into some handling characteristics and then I will uh, take this thing out and do some, oh, take this thing out and do some cutting and let's see how it actually performs and you know how it handles and see if it can, um, let's see if I can tell anything about what the original would have felt like because this is supposed to handle like the original as well. So yeah, all right, let's check out uh, the cutting and some handling. Okay guys, I'm out here on a beautiful day hanging out with my son Jace. We've been having a nice day together and so it's so nice out that I decided to come out and do some cutting with the Schluss Urbach sword by Arms and Armor. And uh, what do you think of this sword, Jace? <laughs> do you have a sword? Yeah. Oh, Jace has a sword. Oh my God, what kind of sword is that? Plastic sword? Show him. Take it out of the sheath, bro. Oh my God. Are you a good cutter? Yeah, you don't do any cutting yet. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, how old are you, Jace? Seven. Yeah? yeah. Do you love it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to get to cutting. JC's going to go over there so we can be safe. And uh, let's see what this is all about. Let's see how I can actually cut. I might be in the video a bit. <laughs> you, might be. you might see me in the video. You, you might, might see him in the video because a little bit. You, I might be in the woods. You might see You might see me. <laughs> Um, I've been out of practice with my cutting, so hopefully I can actually still do this because I want to be able to see what this sword can do and um, just see how this sword wields. So let's check this out. A little bit of uh, waviness there. Awesome. Beautiful. Look at the wood. There we go. There we go. I kind of lost it here at the end, right there. Look at that, guys. I took the cap right in half there. I mean, right on the edge. That's amazing. Here we go. Okay, my friends, now that you've seen the cutting uh, that I did with the sword and my handling of the sword, I can finally give you what I think about its handling characteristics and whether or not I think it's worth a purchase for you. So. Um, I didn't do super extensive cutting with it. As you can see, all I did was cut the soda bottles that I like to cut because I think that they are very good cutting targets and help you with your edge alignment. Um, of course, this sword would have been meant to you, uh, be used against armor and flesh. So, you know, cutting bottles is not necessarily, you know, the same thing as using the sword in combat, but it does show you a lot about edge alignment and gets you to learn how to swing the sword around, right? So how did this thing perform? Well, I will say right off the bat, it is a very, very powerful cutter. Um, this thing was built for power and not finesse. Um, it is a weighty blade um, and it's more weighty in the sense of how the um, weight is distributed as opposed to how much it actually weighs. The sword weighs, uh, my particular sword weighs three pounds almost exactly. It's like a hair above three pounds and um, that is not really, um, that is not really unheard of for a sword of this particular length um, and size. Three pounds is, I would say, probably average, but it feels heavier than three pounds. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that um, what we have here is a quite substantial length blade that doesn't have a ton of profile taper. I mean, just take a look at this thing. It remains quite broad 
um, all the way up to the tip and it's even quite broad over here um, so what that translates to when you're actually swinging this thing around is it feels forward weighted now um, I don't want you guys to get the impression that this thing is unwieldy because it's not it actually is um, quite nicely balanced I mean it does have I don't know if you're gonna be able to see it um, it does have a considerable degree of distal taper which I assume is um, historically accurate to this particular sword because of arms and armors research um, but it doesn't have just like the original doesn't have a particularly uh, narrow blade it's actually quite wide and it stays that way now you at Oakshot um, when he class when he was classifying this sword in his notes referred to this sword or commented on this sword as having an uncharacter uncharacteristically broad blade uh, for its particular type and um, you know that translates into some heavy powerful cutting so uh, are you going to be able to be extremely nimble with this thing? No. Um, it's not hard to control. It's a little bit difficult to recover with, though, because of how much of the weight is situated um, up here. And so I kind of felt as though I was using it that I was having a little bit of a harder time getting this thing to index and get clean cuts out of it because it's so forward weighted. I'm just not used to swords of this length being that way um, now the other part of that is that the grip on this sword is actually shorter than um, other swords that I've used that have this uh, this length blade uh, I'll put the, a link down in the description below to the uh, the measurements of the particular sword so I don't have the actual full measurement of the blade and the grip on hand right now but it'll be down below in the description uh, or at least the link to the website will be and but I will say that this grip is shorter than, than usual for swords um, that I've used that are like this. Um, now, what that does is for me is I, I, I like to have, you know, a little bit of space uh, in between um, on the grip. And uh, I don't really like to grip the sword um, with my hands touching each other. I like to have that little bit of space and oftentimes I like to grab the pommel and we're going to talk about that in a second with this particular sword. But I found myself um, simply just having my hands touch each other was sort of like the natural grip of this sword. I believe that's how this grip was intended to be used and as you can see with both of my hands on here there's no there's no space down here left over uh, so I'm like right on the edge of the pommel. And I have um, medium to small size hands so I mean I would say medium size hands so you know for someone with larger hands I mean you are definitely going to be on the pommel and um, you know maybe that's how this sword was meant to be handled I'm not really sure but I will say that the grip is shorter and what that actually does is is that actually accentuates uh, the forward weight weightiness of this particular blade because if 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 you had a little bit more length here it would take the weight of the pommel and sort of move some of this weight back a little bit towards um, the point moving the point of balance back a little bit and that would have actually made the sword I would say balance a little bit better at least for me now however we don't know the original context in which the sword was designed okay um, its owner may have wanted it to be a weighty, powerful cutter uh, for whatever particular reason. Now, I read an article saying that, you know, this probably would have been, um, been used from horseback and meant to be used from horseback, uh, which is why maybe it has a shorter grip so that you can easily wield the thing with, uh, with one hand. And I will say, um, using it one-handed is not uncomfortable. It's just not particularly nimble. But, but um, you know, it can be done, and it's not really that bad. Uh, but w what I will say, though, is you definitely get the feeling that this thing was designed for power and power only. Now, um, if this was a sword for me, and I was designing it, you know, I would extend this grip out a little bit more. Um, but... Once again, this is a replica of a historical piece, an original that exists. And what Arms and Armor was going were going for was um, historical accuracy and not really historical interpretation. So um, yeah, well, it, it handles okay. You know what I mean? Uh, it, 
I think that if I had some more opportunity to train with this thing and uh, spent some more time with it, that I would get to learn the subtleties of this particular sword and how to cut much more effectively than I did. Because I, in my cutting footage, I did kind of struggle. I wasn't able to get the nice clean cuts that I love to get. I mean, I got a few of them, but you know. In terms of power though, there was that one cut where I cut through the bottle cap. Dude, it sheared that cap right in half. Uh, I mean, I mean, just it was such a clean cut and I, I don't think I've ever really seen that happen with one of my swords. Usually when you strike the cap like that, um, it shatters and it breaks. This cut right through it, which goes to show you how much power this thing actually has in cutting power. And there was absolutely no edge deformation or anything at that spot where the sword struck. So the 6150 high carbon steel is extremely high quality and, and very, very um, strong. And I didn't notice um, any type of uh, edge dullness or um, edge deformation or anything up there where it struck the cap. And that's not always the case. Striking those caps and that harder portion of the bottle has actually caused some significant edge damage, even in higher end swords. Uh, this actually did um, just fine with that. I didn't notice um, anything at all. Now, um, in terms of how sharp it came, this sword actually came quite sharp, uh, paper cutting sharp. Um, I don't have a piece of paper here, but it cuts paper no problem, uh, which is something that was, is greatly appreciated. You guys know if you buy swords um, that oftentimes they don't come sharp enough to even cut uh, and they don't cut paper. paper. Cutting paper is not always an indicator of how well the sword is going to cut um, either in combat or in t cutting bottles because it, it, sometimes it has a lot to do with edge geometry. But in this case, it came very, very sharp, and when your edge alignment is great, it, it cuts bottles extremely clean, um, as you've seen uh, in the test cutting footage. Now, um, one of the other things I want to say is that the grip is very, very comfortable. This leather, extremely comfortable. I didn't really um, notice any type of hot spots or whatever. I did notice, however, that if you grip this this sword by the pommel, it's not very comfortable. This is not a particularly comfortable pommel. And it's because of all of these grooves and recesses, um, they kind of act as a little bit of a hot spot when you're, um, you know, when, when you're gripping the pommel. Now, uh, the other thing is this sword was probably meant to be used with gloves. So that might have been mitigated completely, um, and maybe you are supposed to grip this sword by the pommel, or you can. I mean, who knows? Anyway, with bare hands, it's not particularly comfortable to do, so I actually preferred to uh, ride just above the pommel there. And that actually is actually quite comfortable, and there are no hot spots there. So yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a fun sword to use. It, I, the, the amount of power that this thing delivers, the amount of inertia in the cut that this thing has is incredible. Um, you know, you have a solid diamond um, shaped cross section with no hollow grind and no fullers in this thing. So, you know, you got a lot of power here. And I think that's what the original designers were going for with this type of sword. So does it handle well? I would say yes, but it would probably take some practice to figure out how to control the power of this blade. Um, what else can I say? It, it does cut well. Um, you know, if I had better practice and I was actually better, it would probably perform a lot better. And in the hands of a skilled swordsman, I believe this thing would be amazing. Uh, so do I think that the sword is worth your money? and it's a lot of money. Actually, I do want to mention one more thing before we move on. Uh, let me just put the sword down. So there is an option for um, a, uh, a scabbard. Now, the thing is, on the website, um, for an extra $200, I think it's $195, uh, there is an option for a scabbard. Now, I got that option thinking, well, $200 for a $1,000 sword is actually not that bad. Must have a scabbard, right? Well, they ended up sending this, and as you can see, this is not a scabbard. It's really a sheath. Um, it's a nice, high-quality leather um, that 
you know, sort of matches the grip of the, uh, the, the, the sword there, but, you know, really it's just a floppy sheath, um, and it has this center stitched ridge here in the back. Now, what I will say is that it's very high quality leather. It smells really good. <laughs> it smells like nice high quality leather, and it's done nicely. However, it's not a scabbard. And, um, you know, I wish that they had indicated on the website that uh, what you're actually getting is just a simple leather sheath to store the sword in for safe transport and protection of the blade um, and not an actual scabbard because it's not a scabbard. And had I known that, I don't think I would have spent that extra $200 because, you know... Might as well take that extra 200, save up an extra, you know, 500 and get a custom scabbard made for it. Um, so just be aware that if you are going to order one of these um, swords that um, it's not a real scabbard that it comes with or, or a traditional scabbard. It's a leather sheath made to store the sword and there's no type of fixtures on it or anything that allow you to mount it. Um, so you may want to skip on that. Um, it's a little bit of a downside of this sword and so anyway my final opinion of this thing and whether or not i think you should go out and purchase one well it depends on what kind of collector you are right if you're a collector who enjoys high-end um meticulously well researched historical replicas then yes without a doubt i think the thousand dollars that this sword costs is worth it and that uh, you would be extremely happy to have this in your collection. I actually think any collector would be happy to have this um, in their collection, but it depends. You know, $1,000 is a lot of money. Um, if you're looking for something that has the best handling uh, with the best materials and, um, you know, is, is like extremely well-formed fit, and uh, with machine precision, you know, this is not going to be the sword for you. This is a replica of a historical original uh, using the dimensions and, and the size of the original as close to possible. The asymmetry is reproduced here. Um, the fit and finish, is tr they tried to uh, reproduce that here. And so, yeah, I mean, this sword will be for you if that's what you're looking for. And um, I highly appreciate it and I love it. I think it's a fantastic sword. Uh, I do think it's worth the $1,000 that it costs. Uh, I don't think the scabbard is worth the $200 that they, that, they, that they want for it. But anyway, it's a beautiful sword. And I feel like if you want it, you can go ahead and order it and you'll be extremely happy knowing that you have an amazingly well-made and it's a solid, beautifully constructed sword, well-researched historical replica of an original um, by Arms and Armor with high quality materials. Um, now, the thing is, is that they are pretty backed up at Arms and Armor as it are most people in the world right now. And these things, it took about eight to nine months I want to say nine, you know, it might have even been 10 months uh, from the time I ordered this thing to the time I got it. So if you are uh, someone who doesn't appreciate putting that much money um, on hold for that long, you know, and you just kind of want to get it right away, that's something to take into consideration. These are handmade and they have a large back order. And uh, you're going to be waiting a while uh, to get one of these. Now, um, you may be able to find one on the secondary market. Uh, I do know they are out there. I believe they're probably pretty rare, um, but they are out there. And so if you are interested, I would say check there. You may be able to get one for a decent price. Um, but once again, I, I, I don't know. Anyway, I think it's a beautiful sword. It has some really quirky things about its handling, but, you know... I do believe that it's intentional and you know this is just something that the original designer or creators or maybe even the person who owned it probably wanted and um, yeah it's a fantastic sword and I do love it so I hope you guys enjoyed this review um, please leave a like please leave some comments down below and um, you know stay tuned for other videos I have some more knife videos coming up and I do have some more sword videos coming up and uh, thanks again for stopping by. And uh, until next time, be safe. And uh, yeah, guys, enjoy this hobby. And I'll talk to you guys real soon. All right. Bye.